welcome to the Essential Skills for Humaning podcast, where we explore the fundamental abilities and insights that make us better humans. Here's your host, Christina Eames. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this week's episode of Essential Skills for Humaning. I'm your host, Christina Eames. And for today's episode, Karen Hurt has joined us to share tips for handling workplace conflict. Welcome, Karen. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Now, before we dive into uh, this very big topic, (laughs) can you share a little bit about your background with our listeners and viewers? Yeah, so I run a company with my husband. It's called Let's Grow Leaders. Uh, We've been in business for about 10 years. We're all about really practical tools and techniques for human-centered leaders. Uh, And before founding Let's Grow Leaders, I was at Verizon for 20 years. So first decade was all things HR, leadership development, organizational development, merger integration, lots of merger integration. And then I led a variety of field assignments. So a 2200 person sales team, a 10,000 person customer service organization. So I share that because that's why we're known for practical, because theory is good and practical based on theory and research is even better. And so everything we share is something that we hope that your listeners will be able to go and implement with their teams in their work right away. I love it. Well, and I love that you are using this wisdom, uh, this research to help others, especially with workplace conflict. Now you just had a book come out a couple of days ago as of the release of this episode. Yes, powerful phrases. Um, Can you share a little bit about what led to to that book, maybe some of the research before we get into some. Absolutely. So the the book is called Powerful Phrases for Dealing with Workplace Conflict. And then the subtitle, What to Say Next to Distress the Workday, Build Collaboration and and Calm Difficult Customers. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was interesting because this book came about from a way different than the way our other books have come out. Our publisher, Tim at HarperCollins, called us and he said, we think that right now there is a huge need for people having better tools and techniques, practical ones, to manage the changing dynamics of this workplace post-pandemic. We just had a big meeting and we want somebody to write this book. And we said, who should write it? You guys, because you're really about practical. And we thought, oh, that'll be super easy-ish. Not that writing a book is ever easy, but <laughs> we thought, yeah, we're, all, we're we're pretty good. We should be able to do that. But then we took a step back and said, do we really know what's going on? Mm-hmm. Like we all have a sense of this. And, and we just did not feel in good conscience we could write this without really doing some research. So, and because I like, always like to make things more complicated than <laughs> I never take the easy <laughs> route. So we, uh, we, actually did a extensive research study called the World Workplace Conflict and Collaboration Survey uh, to answer a couple of questions. Is conflict really getting worse in people's minds uh, post-pandemic or, or not? Is it about the same? And then we asked people to think about uh, a major conflict that they've had in the past and what would be their advice to their former self if they were mm. faced with this conflict again? And really use that as the foundation of what we needed to be writing about in this book and what was causing, if there was an increase in conflict, what was causing it? So there, most, 70% of people said that conflict is either the same or more significant than it was before. And we asked, well, why? And so you know, 27% said that it is this feeling of overwhelm and stress and there's coming from all of the changes in the workforce. And there's, a, we break this down in the book. We can go into that if you want, but you know, there, we all know there's a lot of reasons that are causing a lot more stress, right? Uh, more hybrid teams, uh, more matrix organizations. So there's that whole element. And then another 20%, and we could pick more than one choice, but another 27% said, that it is poor management practices. And you know, part of this is our managers really equipped to deal with this changing work environment. And yeah. then interestingly, there was 21% that said mental health challenges that are going on. And so, so those were some of the, the big reasons uh, you know, that, that, that this book is so important and, and that why people need really practical tools right now. Yeah. Well, and I love its practicality. And I know uh, you had mentioned in the book, there's four dimensions 
of productive conflict. Yeah. Before we get into the four dimensions, can you share a little bit about people are like, wait, what productive conflict? <laughs> yeah. Can you share a little bit about that? Yeah. So, you know, I think when we hear the word conflict, you're like, uh, yeah, I, I don't, I don't want, <laughs> I'd rather avoid the conflict than to, to deal with the conflict. And it was interesting because the 30% of the people said that they were experiencing less, less conflict. What they were doing was avoiding it in some way. Right. Uh, so, uh, oh, well, I changed jobs so I don't have to deal with the conflict. And sometimes changing job is the right answer, but that doesn't really mean they're experiencing less conflict because of some productive change. Right. Or, um, you know, or I'm working from home, so I just keep my head down and do my thing and I don't really interact with anybody. So I am having less conflict. Conflict in and out of itself is necessary. You know, and yes. so because conflict leads to means I think this, you think this, let's have a conversation and let's, you know, and so you need some level of productive conflict in an organization. My co-author is my husband. And as you can imagine, you know, we're, we do research together, we write books <laughs> together, do programs together. There is always conflict. Yes. And we still need to go to bed tonight, at, at night, right? <laughs> so you need to co manage conflict well. And, you know, in our circumstance, we are aligned in terms of our values. We have a shared understanding of what success looks like. But in any given day, I'm wanting to move fast. He's wanting to mm. move deliberately. All of that creates conflict. So when we talk about dimensions of productive conflict, it's how do we not shy away from a conflict? But how do we say, what is what I have to say matter? How can I position what I need to say in a way that is going to have the most likelihood of success and to lead to better outcomes? Productive conflict is when we are able to talk about what's what feels yucky and it comes out, we're even better because we had that conversation, right? Yeah. So when we talk about four dimensions, it, it really starts with, with, with human connection. Like, are we connected as human beings? And when you think about this, it's really the connection that we have as human beings before the con before even having a conflict conversation. And then it's how are we connecting it as human beings in the conversation, right? Yeah. So imagine, you know, um, I'm having a co conflict with a coworker. Let's call him Joe. Now, if Joe is a, you know, generally nice guy, he got me out of uh, a jam the other day when my little kid was sick and I'm like, oh, and he told my boss how great I am at pivot tables. Mm -hmm. And then Joe steals my idea. I think he steals my idea. Now, if I have this relationship with him and I, and I think, well, I'm going to be more likely we're connected. I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt thinking, ah, oh, he probably didn't mean to do it. And I'm, it's easier to have a productive conversation. If we're not connected, if I don't know him at all, and I see out of the blue, this guy's stealing my idea, we don't mm -hmm. have connection, boom, the conflict escalates, right? Yeah. So that's the big connection. But in the little connection, it's, you know, starting to say, hey, you know, Christina, I really care about you and, and our success. And I, I really, really want this, this collaboration we're working on to be, to be good. And I have some concerns. Hmm. Right. So we're starting with the connection. We're starting that I have your best interest at heart. Right. And then from there. So, so that's the connection. The next is clarity. And this is, do we have a shared understanding of what success looks like? Hmm. And so much conflict comes from expectations violations. Right. I expected like, let's, let's get real simple. I expected you would empty the dishwasher before you went to work. You didn't empty the dishwasher before you went to work. Now we have a conflict, right? But if I'm like, oh, well, my expectation is I said I'd empty the dishwasher. I didn't say when I was going to empty the dishwasher, right? <laughs> so what does success look like? And so, um, you know, what does success look like for you? You know, and, and having just that simple understanding of getting that up front can go a long way to having more productive conflict. So you've got connection, you've got clarity. And then the next third dimension is curiosity. Mm. And it, are we showing up genuinely interested in one another's perspectives and alternative ways of doing things? And, you know, a lot of conflict comes in if, where people say, no, this is the way it's got to be done. And this, this is the way it's got to be done. Well, that's not curious. Yeah. Right. And so to be able to show up in, in a collaboration and say, huh, um, 
what are, what's an alternative way to do this and really be open to that conversation. And then the final is commitment. And this is another one where we see so much conflict where unproductive conflict, because we don't do what we would say, like schedule the finish. So we continue to have the conversation again. So you and I, we're having a, a, a constant conflict about how we're getting along at staff meetings. I feel like, mm -hmm. um, you know, you feel like you're over uh, every time you say something, I'm interrupting you. So you take me aside and you say, hey, I really care about you. I, and I, I care about our collaboration. What do you think we can do to fix this? So we can all get our voices into the room. We I say, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. I didn't even realize I was doing that. And then we don't schedule a time to follow up again. Well, the next meeting I do it. Now I do it again to you. Now, now it's hard because now you've got to summon the courage to have that conversation again. Yeah. But if we have this conversation and then we say, great, we've got three more staff meetings left in January. Why don't we put a time in, in, in Jan right now on the calendar for January 30th at three o'clock? We're just going to touch base about how this, go how this is going. Now I'm looking at my calendar and I, I see that I've got this meeting coming up with you. I'm paying more attention to how I'm showing up in these staff meetings. And if I don't fix it, you don't have to summon the courage to, to raise the conversation again. You've already got it scheduled. And if I do fix it, you don't have to remember to say thank you for fixing it. You've already got a time schedule to do it. So those are the four dimensions. Well, I love it. Thorough too. It, well, and I love um, how they can be multifaceted, like commitment, right? For commi you know, committing to the relationship before you even get into conflict and then during conflict. And I'm sorry, connection. connection. <laughs> and then commitment, committing to um, the relationship as well as the actions to improve that conflict. Um, oh, and I do need to do a shout out under clarity for your TED talk. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yes. So a little shout out there. Now, before we dive into further uh, ways, you know, takeaways that people can go with this, uh, this topic, let's take a short commercial break. Transform your organization with EANS Training. Our premier interpersonal skills training programs are tailored to enhance your organization's employees in communication emotional intelligence, leadership, and more. We have a catalog of expert-led courses designed to meet the dynamic needs of today's workforce. With highly engaging in-person, hybrid, and remote sessions, we can help elevate your organization's performance and success. Learn more at EansTraining.com. All right, welcome back. Now let's dive into some either even more actionable strategies for this topic. Um, and your the book is called, it starts out with powerful phrases. So I'm just curious, what does that look like in, in relation to productive conflict? Yeah. So a lot of the way you can productive conflict is to get better at communication. And what we really noticed in working with our, our clients and, you know, we would role play through things that people say, Karen, David, just tell me what to say, right? <laughs> yeah. Just like if you were me, what would you say? And, you know, you can't, you can't script every conflict because you don't know what the other person is going to say. But if you can, and you know, it's interesting because so many people in our research said their number one thing, they advice what they would have given to themselves is they would stay calm. 55% said mm -hmm. I would stay calmer. You can be more calm if you are empowered with an approach. And yes. so knowing that you can't script everything, but you can say, all right, so for clarity, connection, curiosity, commitment, what are some words that would work? And so we start with what we call our greatest of all time, our goats, uh, powerful mm -hmm. phrases, a couple of those for each one. And then in the book, we go through and say, okay, so here are your 12 big go-tos. But then what do you do if this happens? What do you do if you're having dealing with a micromanaging boss? Mm -hmm. And you know, how do you really approach that? And so like, for example, micromanaging boss, which is a really big one, uh, we, we hear it all the time, yeah. is, is your boss really micromanaging or are they giving you clear direction because you're not doing something that you need to be doing? And, and so the first set of questions we have here is questions to ask yourself. Nice. Is your boss micromanaging everybody or just you, right? If it's just you, because I, it's so funny in, um, in a lot of times I'll, I'll coach, I'll be going into work. You probably see this all the time when the work that you do, right? You talk to the boss and the boss says, oh my gosh, this employee is just not doing what they need to do. I, how do, why do I have to tell them what to say all the time? 
And then you talk to the employee, they're like, oh my gosh, my boss is a micromanager. Mm. And you're like, right? <laughs> yeah. So, so it's that. And then, um, and then we go through, all right, well, so how do you, and then what are some questions to ask your manager to, to mm -hmm. help dissect that and how you can be showing up differently? And then what do you do if your boss really is a micromanager? You've done all these things and you've determined, yeah, no, she's a micromanager. Yeah. And so, you know, and then from there, you know, hey, I've noticed that uh, you keep asking me for updates on this project. We we scheduled the finish we uh, for Friday at three o'clock. That's when I believe this deliverable is due. But you've called me three times the last three days to ask me for information. What's going on? Hmm. You know, are, are you nervous about something? Is there something that I'm not doing here? What do, what would be a way that I can proactively give you updates that'll make you feel comfortable so that we can, you know, make sure that we're, we get, I can spend time getting to this Friday deadline as opposed to answering your updates. Right. And so you're doing it in a respectful way, but you're doing mm. it through powerful phrases and communication. I've noticed is one of our favorite, uh, you know, and we use that, we have a, a methodology we call the inspire method that mm -hmm. works really well up, down and sideways. So you can go and you initiate the conversation. Hi, um, I really care about you and I want us to be successful. Do you have a minute? My intention for this conversation is to talk about, and that's where you talk about whatever this behavior is that's creating um, icky conflict for you mm -hmm. or a lack of accountability. Maybe somebody is um, consistently coming in late. Hey, I've noticed that you've been coming in late. For example, today our team's meeting started at three. You showed up at three forty-five, and last week we had an in-person oh. meeting, and you came in twenty minutes late. Right? Then I've noticed. Right? So, um, so that's so you've got. I've noticed, and then you're showing. So initiate. I've noticed specific examples. That's what I just did there, and those are that's all creating that that can, you know beginning intention. Then it comes the curiosity. Hmm. What's going on? Why do you think this keeps happening? What do you think we could do to ensure that this happens in our relationship? Right. And then, and that's the real magic of the model is this probe and the invite. So you're probing, you're being curious, showing up genuine curiosity, and you're inviting the per other person to provide their suggestions of what could happen. Why this is so important is psychology 101. People are more mm -hmm. likely to do a behavior change if they've come up with it versus you saying, hey, you really need to be here on time. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and then the end uh, uh, and then the end is the uh, review and the enforce. OK, so what I hear you saying is you're going to create some more white space in your calendar between meetings so that you're not running late to meeting to meeting and you're always late. OK. And then you schedule the finish, you enforce. Let's meet again in two weeks. And that's, you know, what we just talked about earlier. So see how things are going. That sequence can be used for almost anything. You mm -hmm. know, Sebastian, yeah. my 18 year old. Hey, I, I noticed you didn't take out the recycling, right? Mm -hmm. It's Friday. <laughs> <laughs> What's going on, right? What do you think you can do is that you can remember to always take out the recycling without mama having to remind you? Right. Yeah. The teenagers are awesome to practice on. <laughs> <laughs> well, first I love one um, to look at yourself first, right? So look at your perception and your mindset and what are some other ways I can look at this situation or my behavior, right? So it, it, diving into that self-awareness portion. And then I love the sharing of the intention. So oftentimes we forget to do that, right? What is that? We judge others on their behavior and we judge ourselves on our intentions. Yeah, I can't yeah. remember I, whatever that quote yeah. is, but yeah. So actually sharing it and communicating is huge. Yeah. Um, so I love all that. Now, and I noticed you, you did, I noticed <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned I statements. And I think that's like one of the biggest takeaways from previous conflict. I mean, any time, uh, workshops or training or anytime someone has gone through, you know, I'll ask them, you know, you've been through conflict training. What is the main thing that you learned? And like, oh, use I statements. So I was curious, you know, what are your thoughts? I know you noticed, I noticed, but what are your thoughts on I statements? So it's interesting. There, the reason for I statements is well-intentioned. You are, oh, you, because you can only own your experience. I can't own, yeah. and I don't know your intentions, right? I don't, mm -hmm. you know, Hey, you know, but they can, they get twisted for people. Yeah. I've noticed you're being a jerk. 
<laughs> right? And, and you, you see people do that, or you people mm-hmm. see, you see people like stutter with the eye because they want to say, I, you know, I, I, I noticed you that you are doing like, and so that uh, I, I noticed, uh, mm-hmm. uh, you know, and, and so I think that it's the intention of an I statement is really important. It is, are you speaking from your perspective and are you showing up genuinely curious? But um, I hate your approach to this is an I statement. Yeah. You know, I've never liked working with you is an I statement. Yeah. Right. So it's, it, they're, they're, they can be helpful, but they still have to go with all these other things. Yeah. Uh, you know, we talk about in the book, we say, uh, why we don't like I statements. That was one. And then the other is sandwich technique. Oh, no, <laughs> no. <laughs> right. <laughs> You know, and, you know, I think the sandwich, you know, sandwich feedback is, is a problem because, I mean, the intention again is good because you don't want to just only dump on people. But if you, you know, so imagine David's here and he's my husband and co-author and I say, Hey, David, um, Hey, uh, thank, I really want to thank you for all your preparation you have done for these three international programs. The decks look good. We're all buttoned up. It's really going good. But your leadership is derailing our company. <laughs> and then I say, but you're kind of hot. <laughs> What's he going to take away from that, right? Like uh-huh. either he's derailing or he's hot, but he's not, it's too much information. Yeah. But I think, in a, you know, when sandwich feedback is good, if I can say to you, say at the end of this uh, podcast, I say, hey, Christina, I really want to give you, the, uh, thank you so much for taking the time to invite me on your podcast. I've got five more podcasts uh, scheduled this next month. Is there any advice you have for what I could do differently? Now, in that circumstance, it's wonderful for you to say, Karen, you know what I really liked? And if I had one suggestion, it would be this, right? That is, so I call that an open face sandwich, but, but it's because I'm coming to you and I'm asking. And at that point, it would be kind of, it wouldn't be helpful to only tell me the good because I'm really asking mm-hmm. for feedback and it wouldn't be uh, great just to tell me all the things I did wrong. Right. And then make me feel yeah. so. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. I feel the same way about the sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> and the other thing too, that I'll hear from people uh, is, you know, use I statements and then don't use you statements. Yeah. What is your reaction to that? I think it's the same thing, right? Yeah. Like you, because it, and it's easy and it's easy to do in, the more familiar we are. And I think that's, I think that you you always, Mm. right. Um, Yeah. And especially in, you know, our more intimate relationships because people get, they like, well, you, you should know me. And yet you're, you're projecting my intentions or my feelings, you know? Um, But I think that you, there is a way to check in on that in a productive way. Mm -hmm. You seem really frustrated about that. Is this true? Nice. Right. And I'm not saying you're frustrated. I'm saying you, you, I'm experiencing you. You seem frustrated, Mm -hmm. but is that true? I'm now that's a curiosity statement. Yeah. So, yeah, I love it. Bringing in those four, those are comprehensive four dimensions. I love it. (laughs) Now um, let's do a 60 to 90 second commercial on not just the book that's available now, but any other product or service you'd like our listeners and viewers to know about? Uh, well, thank you so much, Christina. So, you know, our, our website is letsgrowleaders.com and you can learn all about our company there. And uh, on LinkedIn, I'm Karen with an I dot hurt. Uh, so love to connect with people there. So yeah, the book is powerful phrases for dealing with workplace conflict, what to say next to de-stress the workday, build collaboration, and calm difficult customers. We also have a companion kit that we're super excited about. It is called the Synergy Stack, and it is a card deck that has the four dimensions that we've been talking about, and each one of them has practical habit. Every card is a habit and a powerful phrase, and uh, we have about 30 different exercises and ways teams can use this to really build Mm -hmm. collaboration. So that is hot off the press, too, and we've been using this really um, with all sizes of organizations, and we're really seeing how fast it gets people to quickly take their uh, action for their team to the next level. I love it. Okay. Final piece of advice. So, you know, one is be the leader you would want your boss to be. 
And mm. it does, this is not just for managers. You know, if you're listening to this and say, yeah, that's great. I, I wish uh, my boss would read this book. I wish we had conflict training in our organization. What can you do to really say, how can I show up and create connection? How can I be more curious in our conversations? How do I, if I'm in a groundhog day with conflict that keeps happening again <laughs> and again, how do I get that to a commitment conversation? And, um, and to be willing to, to go first. Um, and, you know, I would, I would say, you know, if you are in a conflict right now and you're listening and you're like, yeah, it won't work. What's at stake if you stay silent? What's at stake for, for the work that you're doing, for the things that you care about and for your relationships? And use that self-powerful phrase to summon the courage to give it a try. Mm, I love it. Oh, thank you so much for taking the time to share your wisdom with us today, Oh, Karen. Christina, it has been absolutely my pleasure. I, I really, really appreciate the, the time and the important work that you are doing consistently to encourage <laughs> courage. Oh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you for tuning in to the Essential Skills for Humaning podcast. We hope you've gained valuable insights to enhance your journey as a human being. Remember, practice makes progress. Keep honing those essential skills. And until next time, keep being the best version of yourself. For more resources, visit eanstraining.com.